Hello, welcome to Geeks Unleashed, it's episode 93. As usual, I'm Mark. And I'm Jasmine. Uh, just to remind you that our episodes are now dropping every Wednesday. Um, yes, midweek. So we're we're mid-week. doing a midweek pick-me-up for you. Yeah, yeah. So we recorded a little bit earlier, it gives a little bit more time for Jasmine to edit. Like we all, and we also thought, we saw a lot of other people dropping on Wednesdays, and we thought we'd drop in with our friends and um, colleagues, <laughs> so, if you will, <laughs> like for Whiplash Wednesday. So. Yeah. We wanted to be in the mix, man. You know, nobody likes to be left behind. So, uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> All right, before we get started, if you are watching on YouTube, thank you so much. And please be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. If you are listening on your favorite podcast platform, we appreciate that as well. We would also very much appreciate it if you would leave us a five-star review on either Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, or Spotify. You know, um, I'll just quickly write this now because I just remembered something. Like, like, I don't know, Jasmine, if you had had a chance to check out our DMs on Instagram this week. Like... No, I hadn't. I had taken my socials off my phone, so I have not oh, been okay. on any socials for a week. Oh, okay, okay, okay. What um, did I miss? What did I miss? <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> last week, last week in our episode, I said to you something, and then uh, you didn't know it, and I didn't bother to inform you what it was. And, um, <laughs> I missed a British reference. Shut yeah, it. yeah, yeah. I missed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you missed a Brit- British reference, but somebody that we know messaged us to say that they loved that I knew it. Like, obviously I would know it. Um, <laughs> so like, basically I said to you, John Cleese, you know, from 40 Towers and you said, what's that? And um, I mean, of all the things, like you said that instead of Monty Python. Like, and, um, but yeah, anyway, so um, Cookie from um, the Just, Just Little podcast yeah, messaged, yeah. messaged us to say like, he couldn't believe that, you know, that I mentioned 40 Towers. <laughs> Uh, and just like so yeah so it was a it was a one season show I'm just checking actually I can't remember how many episodes it was it was a one season show it came out in 1975 uh 12 episodes it was it was only 12 episodes but it's like so famous uh-huh. um so yeah it's like an incredibly like famous um <laughs> like show so um my, my apologies to all of our British listeners for like, me not getting that very not well not obscure but like very not in my wheelhouse British reference <coughs> My apologies. It just made me think one day I might actually have to just put that on the on the list of things to look at one day one day down the road. Maybe maybe we'll maybe we'll have a British month or something like that. Right, so, and, uh, actually, I, th- I think I've threatened to do that to you before. Like, let's have a British month. So, um, yeah. but no, yeah, it's it is hilarious. Even I remember as a kid watching it. So obviously, I was born uh, in eighty one. I would have probably from memory watched it around the end of the 80s but yeah um as things tend to do when before the age of uh netflix and amazon things mm-hmm. were constantly repeated on normal terrestrial television. oh yeah like, you had to just... wait for that replay to come on tv or it was yeah, syndicated yeah, yeah. like in the middle of the day oh do you know what's really annoying if you'd miss an episode and you didn't record it on video there was yep. no way of watching it unless they released it and if they never released it on tape then that was it um there was this TV show actually on BBC One called Crime Traveller. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had one, um, they had one season and it got cancelled. And I watched every episode except for the final episode of season one. No, and we and we were we were out. And um, I I, I was a kid. I was definitely like somewhere between ten and fifteen. I can't remember. And um, and we were out. I think we were around my grandma's or something. And. Like I literally was like, can we can we put it on? And I don't know what happened. We didn't put it on, and we never watched it. And you know, I've never seen it. And I'm sure I could find it now in the age of technology. But yeah. like, but now I don't really care. <laughs> but, yeah, but that's gonna suck though. You watch a whole series and then you miss the final episode. I know, I know, but back, and like back then, obviously they were never repeated. Yeah, yeah. They were rarely ever, <laughs> or or if they were, they'd be repeated like four or five years later. You know, yeah. and you just don't care. So, yeah. Or or they're repeated in the dead of night when they're trying to fill time in the evenings yeah so. at 3 a.m that 3 a.m time slot which i was definitely asleep somewhere between 10 and 15 so yeah yeah <laughs> um anyway anyway so move on uh, on this week's episode we're going to carry on with our viewing um sort of marathon really? that we're doing That's the it. franchise uh we are reviewing the second harry potter movie in our run-up to our 100th episode and um we'll jump into that uh in the second mm-hmm. part of the show so 
But before we do, we got we, some news this week. This we time, some, we got some news. Well, no, we had a little bit of news. We had a trailer, and oh, we did do the trailer. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. The Thor trailer looks so good. But anyway, we covered that last week, so go listen to our thoughts last week. Um, as I was prepping for this week's episode, I saw a piece of news that excited me. So some Westworld news. So there's been three seasons of Westworld already. The last season came out over two years ago. They said it was delayed due to COVID, but mm-hmm. I still think the gap between season two and three was also pretty big. So I know that Westworld is a pretty expensive and undertaking. Um, it's an expensive undertaking, but I know because it's mainly a CGI field. I mean, I know they have like actors in there, but there's a lot of CGI and, mm-hmm. and big sets and things like that. So I think it does take a lot of work to undertake that show. Anyway, so there's some news on James Marsden who played Teddy Floyd in seasons one and two, and he was killed off during um, towards the end of season two. However, spoiler, his character... by the way, folks, <laughs> spoiler, spoiler, <laughs> spoiler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, we spoil crap on the show. For yeah. our... I mean, we're going to spoil Harry Potter, just so you know. We're gonna yeah, spoil... but Mark said I can't spoil the movie that I watched this weekend or this yeah, past well... weekend. Well, no, you can talk about it. Just don't like <laughs> ruin it. Don't outright ruin it. Like, uh, and um, anyway, so Teddy Floyd is returning for season four. So it was announced at the ATX TV festival on the closing night event. So I don't know. I don't think there was much more than that. However, James Marsden just walked out on stage. So I imagine nice. that probably got a bit of an applause. So I have been to uh, ATX Fest before. It is a lot of fun. That was the first time I'd ever seen Jared Padalecki in person. He has where, where, where is ATX? Austin. Austin, okay. Texas. How far is that from you? Uh, it's about three hours from me. Did you drive it? Of course. Okay. I just wanted. Yeah. No, we drive everywhere in Texas. We're an oil and oh. gas state. That's what we do. No, I mean, you know, <laughs> like I, I probably would, I would drive three hours. Like, I mean, like, I've probably driven more than that, five or six hours, but I don't think I've driven much more than six hours. Yeah. Life. I mean, most, most of the big cities are all within about four to five hours of each other. Now, if you go to some of the smaller places or like West Texas, that takes that takes some time. Um, okay, so I watched the trailer for season four. It looks really good. It was, um, they had some music playing over it. So, which was always done to try and hide stuff, you know, dun, you, dun, don't dun. Get the di- you don't get the dialogue. Um, yeah. However, so season four will premiere on HBO on the 26th of June, so not too far away at 9 p.m. East ET. Oh, that's really close. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it'll be available on HBO Max. Um, so yeah, it's not too far away. So I'm pretty, pretty excited. I don't know when that comes over over here. Probably not normally, not that far. After, yeah. After. It's not. It's not like the old days. Where so where do you watch HBO later. content? Is it on Sky? Normally Sky. Yeah. Or yeah, normally Sky. Sometimes Amazon. Oh, okay. So, but um, not Netflix. I don't think there's any HBO stuff on Netflix from memory. You watch a lot of the CW stuff on Netflix. Uh, can't think there's something there. Yeah, probably. Or Sky. No, Sky. That seems to be on Sky. Okay. So my parents have Virgin. I tend to use theirs. Mm-hmm. Like, um, or like when I'm around their house and stuff like that. But um, Or sometimes I pay for something called Sky Now, which is does it's just a... Um, uh, it's like Netflix, you can cancel it anytime, like monthly. Mm, yeah. So sometimes I'll just pay for it, watch what I want to watch, cancel it off again or whatever. So, yeah. Okay. Um, it's only because I think I pay for Disney, Amazon, and Netflix. So I don't really want to pay for Sky now as well. Yeah. Uh, like <laughs> we, Sky as well. We had that whole streaming conversation yeah, last, yeah, week. last week. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But sometimes I pay for that. But yeah, so I mean, I don't mm-hmm. actually know, but I assume Westworld's probably Sky. Like, so okay. I, may have, I may just wait till it's finished, pay for Sky now for a month. Watch and it. then binge it. Yeah. 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 So, I, to be honest with you, I, I, um, so what happened with Westworld was obviously the first two seasons were set in the park. Um, season three was actually set out in the main, in the real world, had Jason Aaron in, which is brilliant. I love Jason Aaron. Um, I think season four is going to be set in and around New York. Don't know too much more than that, but mm-hmm. I'm excited to see its return. So, cool. That is it. You've not watched Westworld, have you? Um, I have seen some episodes, but I yeah. am by no means attached to it or caught yeah. up or anything. <laughs> I, I, the thing is, I wouldn't say like I am attached to it as in if it didn't come back, I wouldn't necessarily be that bothered. Mm-hmm. Like there's certain shows that you're like, oh, I can't believe that's cancelled now, gutted. I wouldn't be overly bothered about that. But when it's on, it is really good show to watch. It intrigues me. 
Yeah. I, I yeah. like it. And it's very it's very visual, like the and, and uh, to be honest, it's got a really strong cast. Like Tandy Newton is brilliant. Yeah. Um <clears throat> I love Jeffrey Wright. Cast. Yeah, Jeffrey Wright. I was yeah, I was trying to remember his name. Yeah, mm-hmm. he was really good in it as well. Um I don't want to say too much because in case anybody hasn't watched it. If you haven't watched it, I'd recommend going back to watch it. So all right. So uh we also got some another remake surprise coming down the pipeline um arachnophobia yeah the movie about the spiders that take over a town um <laughs> coming it's coming back so it's going to be from a writer director christopher landon uh james wan is actually on as a producer since he has so much free time after him and vin diesel had the fallout over fast 10 uh frank marshall <laughs> who directed the original back in 1990 some of you people that we podcast with weren't even born in 1990. That is insane <laughs> to me. Um, so Frank Marshall is going to be coming back to executive produce. Like, why why do we need a spider film remake? I, I have no idea. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know. I, mean, I was going to say on the list of unnecessary remakes, I think arachnophobia yeah. is there. I do remember hiring this video from the video shop. How cool was that? Like going home. Hiring the video from the video shop. Yeah, the VHS cassette. You hire like, it instead of renting it. Yeah, yeah, renting it, you know, renting it, whatever. <laughs> like, 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 higher, higher rent, sorry. I am always uh, fascinated with British, British, uh, like, your... Yeah, hi, you yeah hi, hire it. You yeah, hire hi. it instead of renting it. What? It's so, like, if you, if you were renting an apartment, you would be hire an apartment? How does that work? No, you wouldn't have to, no, you would say renting an apartment, but, yeah. You hire, hired, hired, yeah, you're questioning my, my skills <laughs> Hi, hi, definitely hired the tape yeah hired interesting I, I, yeah no i'm thinking would i yeah no i'm definitely sure we'd say go and hire a tape hire, hire a copy like yeah 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 i'm pretty sure that's right now like anyway i hired it but okay. you can say rent it too um <laughs> so like anyway i remember there was a video a little independent video store around the corner called video where yeah the cool selection of like modern and really like often dated tapes like um and i remember a little kids section like with thundercats um vhs and yeah. thunderbirds and all the rest of it anyway um i rented arachnophobia brought it home so we um my parents were not happy at all uh, <laughs> rent, even though i'm pretty sure it was like a pg or a 12 or something like and uh but they were not happy that we brought home basically a horror film uh, and uh, anyway, we watched it. I don't really remember it now. It was a long time ago. It was like not far after it came out in 1990 that we watched the it. The only scene I remember from Arachnophobia is the shower scene where that girl is in the shower and then the spider is like crawling. Oh, 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 Ugh. yeah. Do you know, I was just thinking with Arachnophobia, like a lot of people hate spiders mm-hmm. you've already got a massive uphill battle already to get people into theaters yeah they're gonna have to make an extremely good remake especially with like modern technology yeah because that could be an incredibly horrible film to watch yeah so i don't know what you know they're gonna i don't know what angle they want to go down comical still or not but they like... should do something totally different and make it like <coughs> climate based and like all of these different species of spiders are converging on this one spot because of some kind of i don't know global frequency or whatever maybe it could be like they shouldn't get the spiders wet or like feed them after midnight wait a minute um, this sounds <laughs> this sounds oddly <laughs> familiar <laughs> spider gremlins <laughs> well, yeah that's what they should do like <laughs> That's what they should do. Maybe that's what they should do. Like, you know how you had aliens versus predator? You could have a arachnophobia yeah. versus gremlins. I mean, you could, like, you pitting franchises against each other. Oh, man. Oh, you could do an arachnophobia, the thing crossover. Yeah. Well, there's so many That'd good ones cool. that they haven't done. Like, oh. yeah, you got, yeah, you got aliens versus predator. You didn't they have Which Jason the first versus... AVP was really good. The second one, not so much. Yeah. What was it? Jason versus Freddy or something. Didn't they do that? Uh huh. Yeah, so they should definitely consider, to be honest, they should definitely do Gremlins versus something. I know I've gone really out here now. Oh, maybe anyway, Gremlins yeah. versus Tremors. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. Well, uh, we should be put in charge of Hollywood. <laughs> um, some, some studio, please come and pay us money to be consultants. Yeah, we, we, we are available. <laughs> we know what people want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we know what we want. <laughs> yeah. I'll be, uh, Honestly, when I heard about Aliens vs. Predator, I was like, what on earth? And like, oh my God, I was so excited. First one was so good. Yeah. 
Was, second one was not good. No, the second one was terrible. But I did like the one with uh, Adrian Brody. Well, that was Predators. It wasn't like Predators. Oh, Alien. I actually really like Predators. Yeah, Predators. I like that one. Anyway, Arachnophobia remake sounds fairly unnecessary, but yep. mm-hmm. I'm intrigued. I'm not at all. I'm I mean, intrigued. I'm not like no. terrified of spiders, but like, no thanks. No, no, I'm more intrigued to see what they're going to do with it because I, I think it's going to be a real hard sell to get people into the cinema to watch it when a lot of people hate spiders just it's an it's like you know like with, with say scream you know mm-hmm. you don't come across serial killers on a daily basis well i mean unless you live in the u.s but you know that's a different story <laughs> <laughs> uh with jason and freddie they're not common yeah things. you know yeah. with halloween it's still not common with uh, even aliens and predators it's not common yeah spiders is like something uh, people yeah. see on a daily daily basis yep and now and you've already got people that have already got massive fears of spiders like years ago in my old house um one of my neighbors um, was home on her own like the daughter of um uh my neighbors and the mum rang me up and said, can I go around next door and basically to get rid of a spider because their daughter was crapping themselves. So I had to go around <laughs> to my neighbor's house. And um, her daughter was like in her, in her tw- early 20s. It wasn't like she was 12 year old. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so I had to go around and help someone who was like, <laughs> who was only like 10 years younger than me or something. Like, I think I was like 30 or something. So I went around there like, and had to kill a spider or get rid of a spider or whatever I did. I can't remember if I tracked it outside or whatever I did now. And uh, the next day they brought some beers for me. And I was like, no, seriously. I was like, you didn't like to buy beers for me to <laughs> say thanks. Listen, anyway, it's like serious a, business, uh, man. But it basically, it's like a natural thing. And now you're making a modern, and with the CGI they have now. Oh, yeah. Just think how horrible this film is going to be. Yeah. Even if they make it. Well, comical. even if, the, uh, but this day and age, like with, with the animal trainers and wranglers that they have, they're going to use yeah. a shit ton of real spiders on that set too. Oh, this it sounds like well yeah it just sounds oh. yeah oh, I'm, I'm, honest, I'm 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 even though i'm not too sure I'm not, i don't even i'm not even afraid of spiders now like, just imagine though you go and see arachnophobia in that 4d theater where like the seats oh, vibrate and the the wind like blows in your face and that kind of stuff like i would lose my mind <laughs> <coughs> anyway we'll draw a line under our news and move on to our, our next part of our show where we kind of just get a little bit of what we've both been doing, what we've been watching, what we've been reading. And um, I've kind of uh, mainly been binge watching with my wife, FBI Most Wanted. Um, mm-hmm. I was really curious to get through season three of FBI Most Wanted. I had been saying to you, have been moving away from procedurals, but we both like the show. So we kind of been working, well, working our way through it. Mm-hmm. And I had heard that Julian McMonaghan, is that how you say his McMahon. name? McMahon, yeah, had left the show um, towards the end of season three, which I thought was quite unusual for the lead of a show, especially quite early on in season three, you know, something mm-hmm. like season seven to have left. Um, so spoilers here, this obviously did come out, I want to say like two months ago, maybe this episode where he left. So he mm-hmm. left around episode 17. And so his character, Jess McCroy, actually gets, does get killed off in mm. episode 17. And, and there's no way, there's no survival from this. And I think it was deliberate. They showed that he got sort of shot through the neck. Yeah. Uh, so they did like a camera overview and you could see the gunshot in the neck. And I was like, he's not getting out of that. Like, it's not even, uh, you know, we put him into witness protection. I mean, to be honest, he was shot by some low level drug dealer. This, this is what I hated as well. He was the lead of a show, killed off by a... Uh, nobody villain of the week and yeah I but that thought, just tells you there was some bad shit going on behind the scenes well you think that's what it was like, has to be no no main character leaves with like you said being killed off by some shitty low-level character that you're never going to see again i just thought they should have done it in a much more i don't know like a bigger event like it should have been like you know like a crossover with the other fbi or mm-hmm. you know i felt i felt like it should have been a much bigger thing to have your your lead who runs the show killed off much more high profile so i mean apparently he came to them or something and said he wanted to go i don't know i don't know what it was like maybe he would have wanted more money and they said no <laughs> so who knows like you say who knows what it is but yeah the, the thing with the thing with tv like a year two years from now we'll probably find out the truth like cause oh yeah people get a bit freer as they get further away from these things. Yeah. Like, um, <clears throat> Once they land a new project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but what I did like was, so they didn't replace him straight away. They had two episodes where they kind of just had the team running themselves. And mm-hmm. you could tell that they needed a leader because there was a few squabbles in those two episodes. Um, and what I liked as well is Terry O'Quinn, who played um, Jesse's father in the show. He was also in the following episode with... Um, so Jess's character had a partner called Sarah and she they were in the following episode as well so I liked the fact they did put a bit of a gap I thought to myself I bet you any money next episode the new person walks in but actually mm-hmm. I thought it was quite respectful to at least the audience and the characters that they didn't jump straight in to replace him with this new character called Remy Scott who um, <clears throat> I've written it down here Dylan McDermott do you know who Dylan McDermott is mm-hmm. um, so do you know what, though although I really like the character of Jess McCroy this new Remy Scott, the actor, Dylan, is so much stronger. Like, he's a much stronger actor. And I have to say, I'm already preferring him. Uh, it's a shame how they wrote out Jesse's character. I would rather he'd have left naturally. Yeah. Um, like, you know, because he had his daughter leave a couple of episodes earlier. I would have liked it if Julian could have, because she would stay in some sort of private school or something. I would have liked it if he could have said, oh, look, I want to leave the task force to, I don't know, concentrate on family or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um but <clears throat> I guess the trouble with when they do things like that is the audience is wanting, is yep. going to constantly say, when are they coming back? When are exactly. They coming back? So I assume that there was a decision just to kill him off rather than. Yeah. When they kill characters off, it is usually because of bad blood in some aspect. Because if there was no bad blood, then they could have given them the happy fairy tale ending as a just in case, like, hey, maybe in our series finale, you'll come back and. You know, that's what I thought. Like, you know, you're, you know, normally they leave the door open, like they did with, um, you know, there's main CSI. I forget what his name is. The guy who Gil Grissom. Yeah, Gil Grissom. Like he used to always pop back. Mm-hmm. Like even pop back in the remake for the first season. Mm-hmm. So I assume that the creators there had a much better relationship with him. Yeah. So, anyway, so FBI most wanted done that. I won't say too much more about this, but I've been kind of working my way through the current, uh, the remade Gossip Girl TV series. I know everybody likes to diss me for watching uh, girly shows or teenage. This is definitely not like a teenage show, though. Like, oh, Mark. But, like, <coughs> I love the first Gossip Girl, mainly. And this is where I, I loved it for the mystery of who was Gossip Girl, a lot, uh-huh. along with a lot of the other mysteries. And the one thing I hate about this one is that we know who Gossip Girl is. And that I don't like. Yeah. I, um, do you know who Gossip Girl is? I couldn't care less. No, I have no idea who Gossip Girl is. So this is where I think it's wrong on so many levels. It's the te- it's a couple of the teachers at the school. Okay. Um, so basically, what it was it makes is sense all... though. So they decided in the first episode they were fed up of the, the students running the school and basically mm-hmm. like getting teachers fired and you know basically because their kids have got money they can just throw their weight around. So a couple of the um teachers decided to get together and bring back gossip girl like one of them had heard about gossip girl from you know, obviously it was it's a it's a follow-on it's set in the same mm-hmm. world as the previous one so they brought back gossip gossip girl was a blog previously and mm-hmm. when the cw had it now they brought it back as an instagram account which makes more sense because nobody does blogs anymore <laughs> like and um so yeah, I, I, and that's the thing. So the teachers kind of one particular teacher gets too involved in their lives, even outside of the account, like outside. Mm. And so she she's becoming part of her own story, which mm-hmm. is not obviously, you know, what she wanted to do. She kind of wanted it to keep the kids in line, and now she's actually like feeling for the people that she's writing about. You can imagine when this comes See, out, you can't get attached. That's the problem. She's getting attached, and even, but even the other teachers who have kept separated keep saying to her, "You get too attached." Mm-hmm. So, so I'm not finished. I'm almost finished. I've got two episodes left. So, um, I don't know. It's, it's, I don't have the same excitement for it that I did about the first one. Mm-hmm. But all I would say is I love New York. So if it's in New York, pretty much I always give my stuff a chance. So because I, I love New York, like as we know, Jasmine. So, <laughs> um, I thought I would just mention one more thing. Something I read a couple of days ago. Uh, for people on YouTube, you can see the cover. It is the first issue of Immortal X-Men number one, uh, written by Kieran Gillian. This is brilliant. It's like the, the quiet count. I'd say I missed a lot of what's been going on with Jonathan Hickman and he relaunched the X-Men. I kind of missed a lot of that. <clears throat> mm-hmm. um, I've got it in boxes in the garage. One day I'll read them, but I haven't had a chance. One but day. I I picked... Yeah, one day, one day, that magical one day. Yeah. Um, but I did read this and I thought it was really good. Like, it's basically like the, it's like the political side of the X-Men. Um, 
like there's Magneto, there's Charles Xavier, mm -hmm. um, there's Mr. Sinister, um, Mystique, Destiny. It's all the sort of higher ups, like Sebastian Shaw, the White Queen, all the political, like the good guys and the bad guys um and their council and the political basically magneto lee leaves because he wants to go live on mars um and his seat has opened up and basically the whole episode the whole issue is them interviewing a candidate to fill the seat and then they, they choose somebody to fill that seat over somebody else and that other person is very upset at the end of it <laughs> And basically, they they, choose, they almost choose the wrong person because that person basically then decides to throw a massive mutant Temper level. Tantrum. Yeah, but with a mutant level side effects of yeah, trying, yeah. To just, trying to destroy the <clears throat> island that they live on um, because she didn't get chosen. Um, but I thought it was really well written. So I've read most of these. So they've launched a whole load of X-Men titles recently, like um, Knights of X, um, Marauders, Legion of X, um, X-Men Red. And I would say X Men Red I was okay with the rest of them not so much, but this one is brilliant. I'm definitely going to stick with this. I might read one or two more issues of X Men Red, but the rest of them I'm not going to bother with. Yeah, but yeah I'd, I'd recommend this. So cool. Anyway, I will stop there and let you. <laughs> have you watched or read anything this week? Uh, no. It has been uh, it well, it's it's been a weird week. Uh, but I did see Top Gun Maverick. And I gotta say, it was really good. It felt exactly like the first film, not in a bad way. Like it, it felt like those kinds of 80s action films that they don't really make anymore. Um, it was really cool. Obviously, uh, Tom Cruise has some kind of Scientology voodoo thing going on because he does not age. It is incredibly bizarre. I don't understand how that works. Um, huh? What'd you the say? Botox, Botox. <laughs> Whoever does his work is worth every penny because like it looks so natural. Anyway, he looks the same. It's super bizarre. There are a couple of other people in the film that uh, are also in the first film. Um, I thought the way that they handled working around uh, Val Kilmer and his health issues was really tastefully done. Um, I enjoyed the characters. I enjoyed the banter. Of course, like it's always cool to watch people in like fighter jets doing fighter jet stuff. Um, the music was great. It's lots of callbacks to the original film, um, but this one still kind of had its own vibe. And I just like, it was literally just like fun. Like it was just fun to sit there in the theater and watch it. So I got a kick out of Top Gun Maverick. It was, it was well worth the two year wait. Oh yeah, because that was obviously delayed due to COVID. Um, yeah, 2019, it, it, that movie was supposed to come out. I think Tom Cruise will be very pleased by how much it's made as well. So. I don't doubt it because our oh. theater was full. Like, I, I'm pretty sure that theater was sold out. I really want to watch it. I haven't got around to watching it yet. I probably want to watch it for a couple of weeks, to be honest. But yeah, I think it's passed over 200 million just in America. Yeah, I wouldn't have gone, but I had some friends in town because it came out over Memorial Day weekend. So um, they were like, hey, you want to come hang out and watch a movie with us? And I was like, yeah, sure, of course. So that's probably the only reason I got out to see it. I do want to go. My <clears> wife's not so bothered, but she did say she'll go if I want to go. But it's crazy to think that Top Gun came out in 1986. Mm -hmm. And Tom Cruise looks like he hasn't aged a day. He since, Well, he looks maybe like, like five years older versus yeah. like you should look, 30 years older what the hell <laughs> like what was it oh the girl who was in the original top oh my god uh, i know right like Kelly and like Gil Gillis. yeah like, or even just looking at like val kilmer now it's like how how is all how are all of your peers aging and you aren't Something, i mean with val kilmer he, he, with val kilmer obviously he's had a lot of health issues and yeah yeah cancer obviously he's lost his voice and stuff which just must be horrific, like losing your voice. Like, yeah, but they um, played that up in the film. So um, they don't, they don't like ignore it. And they don't, at first I thought that they weren't going to actually have him in it uh, because a lot of the exchanges between Maverick and Ice are over text. Um, but eventually he, he is in the film. So. Well, he, well, you actually see him in the film. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, okay. I, oh, okay. I didn't even think he was going to be in it at all. Yeah, well, so, Tom Cruise fought for it. 
because originally the the director and the producers didn't want to like they didn't want to bother Val Kilmer is is what their take was like we don't want to bother him because of all yeah, the right. stuff that he's going through yeah, right. and Tom was like yeah no he's he's got to be in this movie he's got to be so he fought for it you mean, you mean they didn't want the hassle of him being in it so that's how that sounds to me they didn't want to hassle themselves rather than like they, I assume they just thought, how are we going to put, what are we going to do? But I'm yeah. sure if the, if you wanted to, you'd do it. Like, so. Yeah, but like I said, I thought the way that they handled it was very tasteful. It was not just like, well, that was tacky to bring him in for that and then that's yeah. it. Um, but yeah, it's it's really good. It's, again, I mean, very, very similar to the first film. It has a really nice, like, 80s action feel, but all mm. of the technology is obviously updated. Um, so what I also really liked is that there is like an enemy state in this film but they never name a country so i, oh, I like okay. that it's we can tell like that you know the americans are fighting against somebody but we don't know who that somebody is so mm-hmm. i appreciate it that they didn't vilify like you know how like sometimes in hollywood you get like oh it's middle eastern so like oh we'll just say iran like you know we're just we're we're going to cast a whole bunch of Middle Eastern actors and you all are just from some no-name Middle Eastern country and you are all the bad guys. All the brown people are the bad guys. So they didn't do that this time. This time there is an enemy, but we never ever see enemy faces or anything like that. We only ever see them like in their full fighter pilot gear, helmets on, masks down. So you don't really know who it is. I really want to watch this now. It's annoying. It's <laughs> uh, it does look good. But I want to rewatch the first time before I go. Like, well, yeah. Duh. Did you rewatch it before you went? Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> like, 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 it's been a long time. I want to say it's probably at least 20, 25 years since I've seen it. So. Oh, man. My, one of my favorite things is uh, the theme from the original Highway oh, yeah. to the Day. Like, oh, they, they opened the new film with that same song oh, and i was like yeah song. this is this is this is it all right i'm in yeah. i'm in for the long yeah. haul i like I, do you know though like i know it's the same i know it's another franchise with tom cruise for mission impossible but whenever that music kicks in i'm like oh yeah yes. like, yeah exactly uh, like, i remember once going to see one of the mission impossibles and um i think i went with my mom and dad and my sister and my sister was sitting next to me and i don't think she cares about mission impossible and the music kicked in and i was like yeah she's like you're such a loser like, no <laughs> i mean stuff like that like sometimes the music is so iconic that you don't you can't pull the music and the film apart like with mm. like with harry potter John Williams' score for Harry Potter, whenever that music drops, it's all like, oh yeah, some magical shit's about to happen. Like, it just puts you in the zone of whatever you're about to watch. Like, that's how you know you've got a really, really good score to back you up. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, Okay, I think actually you've lined that up pretty well. So we should segue into our what i call well i guess it's like the third part of the show isn't it you know you got news what we've been watching and now into our main review our main yeah event. the meat and potatoes uh, yeah yeah so harry potter and the chamber of secrets 2002 so wow, wow. um 2002 <laughs> well, that is 20 years ago uh um, man so again i didn't watch this when it came out in cinema uh i didn't care lord of the rings was on that's all I cared about. Yeah. Like, so anyway, directed by Chris Columbus, screenplay by Steve Kloves, obviously based on Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets by J.K. Rowling. Mm-hmm. Rowling, Rowling, Rowling. Um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> She's like, British. I figured you would have known how to pronounce that one. I'd say Rowling. So. That's what I say, Rowling. Yeah, yeah Rowling, yeah. Um, uh, I was going to say, I could do the first couple of lines here if you want to do the next part. Like, okay. Not all the next couple. So Daniel Radcliffe is Harry Potter. Rupert Grint is Ron Weasley. Emma Watson is Hermione Granger. Richard Harris as Al- Albus Dumbledore. Maggie Smith as Professor McGonagall. Uh, Robbie Coltrane as Hagrid. Fiona Shaw as Aunt Petunia uh, Dursley. Uh, Harry Me- Meeling. Melling. Um, Melling as Dudley. Dudley Dursley and do you want to take over? Yeah, Richard Griffith uh, comes back as Uncle Vernon. Tom Felton, Draco Malfoy, Alan Rickman as Professor Snape. Toby Jones, new one, uh, as the voice of Dobby the House Elf and Bonnie Wright as Jenny. Um, Obviously, she is, obviously Bonnie Wright was in it previously, but just a tiny cameo. This time she and she does make her way to Hogwarts as her first year. It's her first year. Oh, Jenny. Go Jenny. So with a budget of 100 million. Which is less than the first film. Yeah. The first film was 125. 
How much did it make, Jasmine? This one didn't hit the billion mark. This one stopped off at 879 million, which is nothing to turn your nose up at. That's a lot of damn money. So, I mean, I bet you any money Warner Brothers were over the moon that they turned 100 million into almost 900 million. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty so, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure JK got a good chunk of the wedge. Right. Well, doubtful. They they probably paid her before all of this stuff came out and then she gets a small percentage of royalties afterwards they paid her a big chunk up front for the rights to her books but i don't think she made as much on the films well you don't think so just the books uh i would think that's what i would think i don't know but anyway so summary of the plot i mean it's come on you gave us a two sentence uh oh. summary last week come on do it oh, again oh no i know i, know. I didn't prep myself okay basically <laughs> year two it's like every year isn't it you get to school they come up from their summer holidays you know do you know one of the things i did have to say as we were watching as i was re-watching this was the dudley uh dudley family the dursley sorry should be seriously done for child neglect and just you name it like they why harry potter just hasn't called the local authorities on his so-called parents like <laughs> you know he he has locks like literally two or three padlocks on his door in the opening act he has bars put across his window basically he as every movie starts off with he is treated horribly by them mm -hmm. and then it's this dream to get to hogwarts where his sort of family and new friends are mm -hmm. what's brilliant is he um does head off and we don't get to see him by train we get to see him by flying car this time make his way to hogwarts mm -hmm. um as usual we get to go through the sort of the normal hall type food you know all the friends mix in we get mm -hmm. we get obviously um quidditch we get the mystery of the the movie but this one is like kids and animals petrified they're basically in some sort of suspended animation there's mm -hmm. links to the past as it always is and actually what i quite liked was there's links to actually when hogwarts was founded over a thousand years ago all mm -hmm. four houses uh, i'd actually forgotten about that um so i quite liked how they jump in from not just talking about obviously um uh you know the um crap the guy should not be named um oh voldemort yeah, yeah obviously they have voldemort tom ridley i was thinking oh, sorry um tom riddle well, tom riddle sorry tom riddle um and like but they also what i liked was how they talked about how hogwarts was founded by the four founding um, who created the houses mm -hmm. i thought that was pretty cool so they obviously do that jumping in and out of the mystery of and the past um then you have the whole mystery of where is the chamber of secrets mm -hmm. who is a descendant of slytherin house um and then we sort of come towards an ending the climax of the battle scene harry kind of saves the day what i liked was actually that Ginny wheezy was involved in that sort of final battle mm -hmm. which was quite cool and then we sort of circle back round to everybody being happy happy families and i would imagine they all go off to their own families again and then film three will start so yeah that's kind of really my summary of the movie like so <laughs> Uh, not as concise uh, as last week but you know i still give you an a and yeah, a, yeah, a for effort yeah. <laughs> uh, so i would say like they're all very formula except for the last two yes i would agree with that um yeah. but i i uh, i'll talk about that part later so got a few fun facts about harry potter 2 before we jump into everything uh we were just talking about an arachnophobia remake well it turns out that rupert grant is deathly afraid of spiders and if you have not seen the second harry potter film there are spiders like gigantic gargantuan spiders in this film um and in the scene where harry and ron are in the in aragog's lair uh ron or rupert grant has actually never gone back and watched the second film because he does not want to watch what all of the actual CGI spiders look like in the final cut because all he is right. so terrified of spiders. <laughs> so they basically said that uh, the way that Ron is so uncomfortable in that entire sequence was actually just Rupert being uncomfortable being surrounded by spiders. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Which I guess that has to suck as like a kid. You're like a 13 year old kid and you're like, this is probably my second acting job ever. And they put me in the middle of the thing that I am most terrified of. Like, that's great. <laughs> yeah like i can't imagine that like especially that's a big ass spider uh yeah 
yeah i mean those aragog doesn't really do much moving but um so they had built a big animatronic aragog uh so he actually was not cgi he was he was a thing that they could interact with but all of the other spiders all of the smaller big spiders were all cgi um also we were talking about people getting paid and uh trying to make sure that they get that cheddar when they take on film roles daniel radcliffe the face of the harry potter franchise was only offered a hundred and twenty five thousand pounds to come back for the second film and thankfully his agent was like you got me fucked up if you think that your one billion dollar film franchise is going to pay my actor $125,000. So um, his agent stepped in and renegotiated and he ended up making 2 million pounds, which is a oh. huge come up from 125,000. So he was paid 2 million pounds for the second film. Crazy. So right. the moral of that story is uh, make sure you always have somebody that is on your side fighting for your money. Okay. Cause wow. Can you imagine like, <laughs> That's a big jump, 125,000 up to 2 million. Oh, I, I just read here, you, you, um, cause you, you wrote these down. Um, Draco, Dra Draco Malfoy, when he says to Harry, um, I didn't know you could read, was actually just improvised because Tom Felton, uh, Felton <laughs> forgot his line. Yeah. Um, I thought that's pretty good actually, like that they kept that in. I'd yeah. love to know what his original line was. Oh yeah, I don't know what the original line was. Um, but that's it was that's funny to me because the I didn't know you could read is one of my favorite lines from this film. And it turns out it was improvised. But that is one thing that me and my friends still say to each other to this day. Like if someone mentions anytime that they mention something about reading, one of mm. us is definitely gonna chime in with, I didn't know you could read. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh -huh. One thing I did write down, but some other improvised lines, the scene in Diagon Alley where Lucius confronts the Weasleys and Harry, when Lucius says, well, let us hope that we always have Harry Potter around to save the day. And Daniel Radcliffe replies with, uh, don't worry, I will be. Both of those lines were improvised. Jason Isaacs improvised his line and Daniel Radcliffe improvised his retort back to him. So I thought that oh, wow. was... That's pretty impressive for you as a kid to go toe to toe improvising with Jason Isaacs. Like, all right, all right, Daniel Radcliffe, I see you. Have you seen that um, that talk show? I think it's Jimmy Kimmel where Daniel Radcliffe does um, like rapping, but he does it in order of the alphabet. No. <laughs> oh, you should Google it. Seriously, like Daniel Radcliffe, like rapping, um, like alphabet aerobics or something. What do they call it? Like alphabet seriously it's hilarious like he actually <laughs> raps from a to z uh yeah uh alphabet aerobics yeah yeah that's what it's called then okay, uh, it on, on jimmy fallon it's absolutely brilliant so i know it's got nothing to do with this movie um but seriously <laughs> like look it up so um i was gonna say do you want to jump into our thoughts of Harry Potter 2 or do you want to go through more of your facts? Um, just one more. So, okay. which which is something that I noticed this time around. I don't think I noticed what Lucia said the first few times I watched this film, but at the very end when um, everything has been resolved and Harry gives, or Harry ends up tricking Lucius into freeing Dobby. Uh, yeah. Um, before he he gets really upset lucius gets really upset and he pulls out his wand to attack harry and you can hear him say avada which of course if you have done the whole series you know that the one of the three unthinkable curses avada kedavra is the instant death curse mm -hmm. um and <laughs> what i thought was really funny is jason isaac said while he was filming this movie he was reading the fourth book and the fourth book is when we are first introduced to the killing curse and he said there was no script there was no lines that he was supposed to say when he pulled his wand out on harry um and so he was like i mean avada kedavra was the only curse i could think of in that moment because when i was watching the movie this time i was like surely surely lucius is not going to stand here and literally kill this kid in the halls of hogwarts like i know that's not what's about to happen 
Um, and of course, Dobby saves the day. But still, like the fact that Lucius pulled out the killing curse, I was like, hold on, man. Like, for real? But just you just left Dumbledore's office. Like you are literally at the staircase to Dumbledore's office and you about to kill a kid in Hogwarts. I don't know about I that, mean, Lucius. I imagine that would have gone that's down messed up even for you, me. man. Well, I think I don't think they would have uh like that too much yeah (laughs) Peter done that so but yeah um I was gonna say it was pretty it's pretty cool like just um Lucius I love I love Lucius like yeah I love Jason uh, Isaacs he's so good and everything my favorite Jason Isaacs film has been Horizon uh, best horror film ever he um was brilliant in Star Trek Discovery yes yes he was so good I love love loved the first season the first two seasons of uh, such a discovery were absolutely brilliant season three however (laughs) leave something to be desired oh it's terrible now that's another conversation for another day oh no no but jason isaac in season one was so good Mm -hmm. like and that and for those who've not watched Star Trek discovery that twist was so good yeah he pulled it off so well yeah anyway thoughts on uh, film two i was gonna say episode two film two for me I would say I preferred film one over film two. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was parts of film two I liked, um, but I would say it kind of felt like filler. It felt like buddy cop between Ron and Harry. Buddy cop. <laughs> like it did. Like, buddy, okay. like that's what, as I was watching it, I because I I forgot it's been so long since I watched it. I was like, Hermione was hardly in this. I was yeah, like, yeah. again, I was like, the lead girl gets like 25% of the movie where like, you know, even the other females in there, like um, McGonagall, hardly in there. Like it felt very much like a, a male driven movie again. Mm-hmm. Like, and um, just, yeah, like Ron and Ron and um, Harry, it was very much a buddy, buddy movie. Like, and I, as I was watching it, this feels like a buddy cop thing. Just yeah. like, that's, and like, cause it's obviously they've got humor between them, especially like from Ron. I don't know, it just was a bit, how have I forgotten how little the female presence was in this movie? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I didn't even notice that. Like I didn't, I didn't even notice that this time around. Like, yeah, no, I did. No, I thought I thought it's a shame that Hermione is the lead female and she's got hardly any presence in this film. Yeah. So. I mean, she still kind of saves the day, even though she's well, yeah. not around. But yeah. yeah. So um, I would say um this film is darker than I remember. I yeah. it's been a while. I mean, I've seen the second film more than once but it's been a while since the last time i watched it mm-hmm. and i didn't realize uh, like I, I guess i didn't remember that the series gets so dark so quickly i thought mm-hmm. that everything didn't get dark until the third film i mean i think the dirt third film definitely takes a much darker leap um but this film is darker than i remember and i think i actually kind of enjoyed it a lot more this time around than i ever have before um So, cause I enjoy the, uh, I thought that they actually did flashbacks pretty well. It was interesting to get to know Tom Riddle. Um, That really comes into play in movies seven and eight, Uh, but that's definitely long game. Um, It was interesting to go back. It was interesting to me the way that they had actual death in this movie with Uh, moaning myrtle like we see her as a ghost in the present day but like we go back in time in the flashbacks and we see her actually as a like dead student um Mm -hmm. so i thought it was interesting that they took it to that level of dark but i also like that we got a much more emotional uh just like the emotions seem to be running a bit higher for all the kids in in this one um yeah there was still a lot of humor but it was very much kind of you're watching them as they start to understand like, Oh, shit's getting real. Um, (laughs) So it was really, it was really kind of fun to watch them from the first film where they still kind of have like these wide googly eyes, like, Oh my God, I'm at Hogwarts and this is amazing. And I get to do magic and yada, yada, yada. Like they still have that very innocent vibe in the first film, but by the second film, it's very much like, okay, the honeymoon period is already over. Like now we got to get down to business. Now shit gets real. Um, so I really kind of just appreciate it that they basically just put their heads down and and did the work, um, in the second film. So the second film is very much like a, 
I would say like a commuter film, like it gets you from point A to point B. Um, it not, it's not like this spectacular epiphany kind of film, but mm -hmm. it's more like a, a utility film. Like it, it does a really good job of wrapping up the story that we got in the first film, giving you a whole new story with new background information that you're going to carry with you into the rest of the series. It felt to me like, um, like a bridge in film, like a, yeah. like a fit, like, yeah, that's kind of definitely what I'd say. It's not my, one of my favorites. Um, yeah. It, before it used to be my least favorite of all eight films. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that may still be the case, uh, but I enjoyed it more than I remember enjoying it is yeah. what I'll say. Yeah. Um, okay. So <clears throat> Do you have a favorite character? From Certainly not your favorite character. I just now read oh. what you said. Good God. Uh, <laughs> like, yeah, so yes. in, uh, in the second film, my favorite character is Ron. Uh, oh. I just enjoyed Ron so much in the second film, the poor kid and like just everything kept happening to him. It was like a pile on for Ron. It's like, you steal your parents' car, you get caught. Now you got the muggles that see flying cars and everybody knows that you messed up. You get the howler, you get really embarrassed. You got to go deal with spiders, even though you're terrified of spiders. Like I just, I just really enjoyed Ron in, in the second film. So he was definitely Ron, my favorite in this film. I think Ron definitely had a big presence <clears throat> in this movie. And yeah, like you say, a lot happened to him. Uh, the Howler was a great scene. Um, <laughs> him rescuing <laughs> Harry in the car, in the flying car of his brothers was brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he, he did go through quite a transition. Even the, the part where he, him and Harmony getting reunited at the end was quite awkward. Yeah. Obviously that's J.K. Rowling setting up <clears throat> sort of tension between the two of them. Ah, that uh, was not the case. That, was that scene was? was because uh emma watson uh was embarrassed and she was too shy to hug both daniel radcliffe and rupert grant and so because she was so awkward with it they left it in the film but that was completely unintentional but of course like it it played really well because everybody reads it exactly the way you did where they read it like oh i can see like you guys we can we i can see how you guys end up together by the end of this whole series but like oh, that so was completely that incidental so she just felt weird, like hugging two guys. That what it was. Yeah, so. in front of everyone. So she oh, said she okay. was super nervous in the great hall with all of the cast out there. And so like originally, like she kept, she would hug Harry, but it was basically the hug was too fast. Mm. And so she kept, it, it, the whole sequence was awkward to film. And so they finally just like left it to where she would hug Harry. And then when it came time to hug Ron, she was just kind of like, eh, let's just shake hands. In bed. Oh, okay. Like... Yeah. I, I, I sort of I read it in two ways. Like I read it that she likes Harry more, but equally that she does like Ron. You can mm -hmm. take that scene in two different ways. Yeah. Like, because uh, I don't know, I've got more thoughts on the dynamic. But I, oh, I there's plenty to talk about with their dynamic come uh, the first the towards, of the towards seventh. the end. Towards, yeah. yeah, towards the end, I have views on the three of them. So, uh, anyway, my favorite character was Dobby, the house elf. Gross. Like, like he is a great funny character like humorous Dobby. humorous character like i love it in the beginning when he comes in jumping on the bed i love his like how mischievous he is when he's like trying to basically does everything to try and help save harry when he gets the uh, magic uh the cake and magics it over the <coughs> the the guest of um harry's uncle and mm -hmm. like i just i love how mischievous he is and uh, but i just love at the end how grateful he is as well like Master presented me with a sock. Master's <laughs> presented me with clothing. Dobby now free. Yeah. Like and all this. Like I just love how his excitement that he's just given a sock. Yeah. I was just like, I was like, how can you imagine just giving not even just not two socks, like one singular sock. sock like, yeah. And uh, and I just love how he steps in to like protect Harry. Like just you will not attack Harry Potter. Like, yeah. And um, I, I don't know. I love him. I think he's cute. I think he's mischievous. Like they should so do an animated spin off just with Dobby. Like, uh, they can't though. So well, no, you know. no prequel, prequel, <laughs> okay. or something. You know, they, they all love prequels. Like no, I yeah. know what happens later on. But like, <laughs> um, but they should do. You know how they do those like animated shorts. Yeah. You know, like like four minute shorts. You know, they should release like a couple of these four minute shorts on HBO Max or something like that with Dobby or something like that. Like, I hated Dobby so much. I really oh, did. Dobby's, I hated Dobby. I hated Dobby up until his last breath. Like that. I hated him all the way until like. <coughs> the end. Oh, it's magic. They can bring him back. 
<laughs> and uh, anyway, um, last last time, magical item. Did your favorite magical item? I I did. You go first because I didn't pick one for this one, but I'm gonna think about it. Okay, okay. So I was thinking about it. Oh, um, I got mine. Okay, yeah. Although the hat does make a reappearance, this yes. uh, this film does top. This item does top it for me. The invisibility cloak. I was oh like, yeah. How cool, how cool would that be? Yeah. Like the invisibility cloak. I, I would yeah. love the invisibility cloak. I don't know what I would do with it in the real oh, world. Oh man, I would like, do exactly what Harry does. I'd be a fly mm. on the wall at all these meetings and all kinds of stuff. I would be oh. everywhere with that damn invisibility cloak. Yeah. No, I would love. I would love that invisibility cloak. It would be amazing. So, um, I don't know if there's a way of going somewhere you can find out, like tips on horses or something like that like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like obviously you can't get lottery numbers but like maybe you could get, go into some bookie's house and like find out what the best horses are for a race or something like that i so, mean yeah. maybe hey yeah. you never know what's your favorite magical <laughs> item oh the map, the map. i oh, yeah, solemnly yeah, yeah. swear that i am up to no good yes the oh map. yeah no i love the map too so yeah in this um, film yeah i said what did i say in the first film i said it was the moving pictures on the papers Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. All and so this paper, film, yeah. I'm gonna go with. Uh, I'm going with the map. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The map. Um, okay. What about your thoughts then on this? Oh picture? wait, no, the map oh. is not until the third film. The map's not until the third film. Okay, so. Oh, you confused me. Favorite yeah. magical item in this film. Favorite magical item in this film. Let me see. I did think to myself that map isn't in this film, but I thought, okay, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, well, I watched them back to back, so yeah, yeah. that's probably why. Um. Ooh, favorite magical item in the second film. In that case, I'm going to have to go with the car. Oh, yeah, the car. Because I never the understood the car. It's like the, the car lets you drive it, but also the car has a <laughs> personality. Like the car is schizophrenic. I don't, I, it's oh, weird. The, like, car, the car I did love. Because like, I started yeah. to question again, like, how do they make these magical items? Or is it real? Like, or is yeah. it actually like a car built by humans and they put magic on it? Like, or is there somewhere that actually makes magical items? Like, yeah. I don't know. Like, is there magical engineers? Like, do they have magical <laughs> car showrooms? Like, <laughs> where, what happens? Like, maybe it is like they enchant the car. Like, they buy muggle cars and they then they enchant the them. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I can't imagine there's like a high demand for actually pre-built magical cars so, yeah i don't think like, so either so but anyway um yes yeah, so your the, your thoughts on the structure of the movie sort of you know the writing and the world building and that kind of thing like what are your thoughts um i thought this one did a good job of expanding everything that they laid out in the first film so we get to see a bit more they you know they talk about the forbidden woods mm -hmm. in the first one but we actually go into the woods this time um and it's just more of they talked about these things in the first film and now we're actually seeing them in the second film. So it's like the, the payoff is happening at a good clip throughout the second film. Um, but there's still so much new stuff that's introduced and it doesn't feel overwhelming. Um, I don't think that there's ever a point where I felt like they were moving too quickly with the information that they were giving us or the situations that they were putting the kids in. Um, so I thought that structure wise, it it flows at a really good clip. Uh, this is the longest of all of the films, even though this is the shortest of all of the books. Um, so I think that they probably did that on purpose to kind of solidify the foundation that they put up in the first film. Um, so we get to see more of Hogwarts. We get to see them exploring the castle a bit more. We get to see obviously the Chamber of Secrets, um, but we also get to see outside stuff. We go to the Forbidden Forest and um we obviously we learn a lot more about the wampum willow um so we're continuously learning more and more about some of the things that have been mentioned before um and as far as like the writing i think it it is elevated from the first film the first film definitely feels very juvenile not in a bad way but it definitely feels very geared towards children this yeah. film definitely feels like a step up. Like this is a level up film. Um, and it feels like they made that transition very well from innocent bright eyed kids to now we're in the thick of it kind of kids. Um, so I, I thought that the, yeah, I, I thought it transitioned well. And I mean, they tamed a lot of stuff down. Ron feels a lot less 
um, like snarky and stupid in this one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he gets into a lot of trouble and he has a lot of comic relief, but like he doesn't feel as annoying as he felt in the first film. They tamp down Hermione's like uh, know it allness a bit in this film. So she feels more aligned with Harry and Ron. So they feel like one like actual friend group versus like two guys that kind of pick on her sometimes. Yeah. Um, so I think that they did a, a better job of like making everything a bit more cohesive. Uh, I think they did take some of the some of the stuff that was a little iffy or wonky about the first film and they kind of cleaned it up a bit. Um, so overall, I think it I think it flows pretty well. I think they did a good job with keeping to what they had already laid out and then kind of expanding on that world for this film. Yeah, I think um, yeah, I agree with you. I think they've done well in terms of they sort of replicated it like the formula, you know, they've got mm-hmm. the home environment with Harry. What I did like though this time around was that they introduced the Weasleys family, mm-hmm. um, that we got to deviate away from um, just the Dursleys. Just just the Dursleys. So yeah. I like the fact that we got a bit of the Weasleys this time around. I like the fact that we did go back to Diagon Alley, which is mm-hmm. again formula. Um, I, I love the fact that again, then we get to the school, but I love that they did take a different thing straight away. They broke away from formula by having Harry and Ron fly there by a car, like you said, mm-hmm. how great and funny was that? Um, and so we got to miss the train. So I do miss the train. I like the train going to school thing. I do love that yeah. we have that. Um, but it was quite nice that they sort of spiced it up in this book, um, yeah. book slash film. Um <clears throat> And then obviously then once we get there, it's the normal formula type stuff, the Quidditch, the mystery. Mm-hmm. Um, but I love how they interlace this movie with subplots again, like Neville and, you know, Quidditch again is sort of interlaced. You know, we've got the new teacher, you know, the Defence Against the Dark Arts and how he's quite, I forget his name, pompous. And actually Gilderoy fraud. Lockhart. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, he's a complete and utter fraud. Yeah. I mean, it's a complete fraud just, just by even talking to him, you can see he's a fraud. Like... Mm-hmm. <clears throat> But I love actually finally we get out of him the truth that he just basically steals everyone else's adventures. Yeah, and, and then wipes their memories. Wipes like, their memories. So yeah. actually, he's not a nice guy at all. Like, yeah. And, uh, but what I thought was, because I couldn't remember quite how the film went, to be honest. So I thought this, it's clear, it's too obvious to make the new teacher the villain of the movie. Yeah. But actually, so we've got that whole subplot running as well. Like his, his journey actually was he's quite pompous, yeah. selfish guy and then it turns out actually he is a pompous selfish guy and actually yeah. he's just not a bad guy well he is a bad guy but a bad guy in a different way like yeah. he's not the, he's not the villain but he is a you know he is a villain of sorts because yeah. he's wiping people's memories that's not a good thing yeah like, and taking their know, stories and making money off of story, it make, he's making making money off of other wizards stories yeah. so so i love it you've got all these interlacing things and they all come together at the end um mm-hmm. as harry defeats tom riddle and Again, we've got Voldemort as the villain of the movie. Yep. Um, <clears throat> and basically, and then it ends quite nicely with Hermione coming into the hall and everyone's all happy. And yeah. They basically structure it all quite well. They have tiny subplots that go in and out. It's yeah. kind of almost like um, like sort of um, like a dance, you know, like you sort of move around. Like mm-hmm. it's done quite well. Like nothing feels like it's too much of one story over another. Yeah. And it's just sort of weave together quite well like the structure of it's quite well although I there's something about this movie that doesn't make me enjoy it as much as the first one it does feel like a, a filler sort of bridge film but like I still think it was an enjoyable movie just not my favorite of, of yeah. what we've watched so far so yeah I think it's hard for this one to be a favorite because it's not it nothing that great happens like yeah it's not boring by any means but it's not you know again there's no like epiphanies there's no breakthroughs it's just mm-hmm. kind of you actually get to see them putting things into action finally um yeah. so yeah i mean filler but not necessarily like we could have done without it i don't think you could skip this film um but it's definitely not going to be the exciting driving things forward introducing crazy new things kind of kind of i definitely thing. don't think you can skip it because they also like how they um Dumbledore says to Harry at the end how when he killed Harry's parents some of his powers went into Harry mm-hmm. we later on find out that it's not just some of his powers that went into Harry we find right. out more about that event later so there's right. obviously obviously there's an importance to this book and this yeah. film um, but it's not 
on the surface as important you don't realize how important it is and also the harry can pick, speak parcel time and speak, yep. speak to the snakes again we'll see how important that is later on so there's a lot of setup in this movie mm-hmm. that is taken later on so you definitely can't skip this movie oh, i yeah. just don't think it, i mean you could probably skip it no like, i mean but, but you miss like, out on so much context later if you skip this yeah. film because like even even the small details like when they get off the train and they get on those carriages in the, yeah. in this film you get to see a clear picture of the carriages don't have anything pulling them yeah but when you get to the fifth film and you see what is actually pulling these carriages it takes you all the way back to the second film because you're like oh my god like this that is some serious detailing that they have put as like just kind of little nuggets that they're dropping along the way but a lot of the stuff that they put into this film is all going to come back into play at some point in the rest of the series yeah yeah no definitely um is there anything you would have cut or changed in this film? Cut or changed? Um, I mean, I guess I can't cut out Dobby. <laughs> but, um, he, even he has an importance in this Yeah, movie. yeah, he does. He does. Um, I think... I, it, I, I don't really have an answer as to how I would have done it differently, but like, I feel like they could have done some reworking with the way they did Tom Riddle Mm. Um, because he he's a memory yeah but so at the at the very end sequence in the chamber of secrets it's like okay he's a memory like why why do we even need to like why are you scared of him like he he's not technically real yet Mm. um so I just kind of and again I have no idea how I would have done it but like I it for him to be as menacing as he is, because I think that the actor who played him did have like this menacing appearance, but it's like you're a memory, like you're not even real and you you don't have all of your powers yet. So I don't know why he had as much sway as he did. Yeah. I, so that's that's the part that confuses me. Yeah. yeah. Also the threat of a memory. Right, exactly. Exactly. So, and I mean, yeah. obviously Harry figures that out and finds a way to you know get rid of the memory but at mm. the same time it's like but why we got to jump through all these damn hoops for like a memory yeah. in the first place you know it's just an it's just another clever way of having Voldemort as the yeah. villain but still not meeting Voldemort yet yeah so also I was Voldemort... very confused as to how it's a memory so you are set in your time from 50 years ago how on earth do you even have any context as to who Harry Potter is mm. that really confused it's, me that's probably something that well, you read the books, though, didn't you? I haven't read I the books. I don't remember, though. Okay. Um, I know. But I, I, maybe, I was going to say maybe the books give some more clarity. But no, I know what you maybe. mean, though, with the film. I mean, it's unless he pulled that stuff out of clear. Jenny's memories, then um, if, if that's the case, that doesn't really come across very clearly in the film. But that confused me. Like, this time watching it, um, I was just like, how do you know who Harry Potter is? You're a memory. Like, you are a piece of Voldemort, but you're a piece of Voldemort from 50 years ago before probably before like Harry Potter's parents were even born. Like, yeah. The thing I probably would change in this film is I think Ginny and Hermione should have been given more presence and screen time, especially with Ginny as she was so vital towards the end. Mm-hmm. Um, she was sort of got, I don't know, one or two tiny scenes at the beginning and then suddenly she's at the end. Like, I just, for me, there should have been a little bit more from her. Um, mm-hmm. but again, maybe she's given that in the books, I don't know, but I would like to have seen a bit more presence from Bonnie Roy in this movie to make it yeah feel more vital at the end so, yeah i think they tried to keep it such a big secret as to who was writing all of these messages um yeah. but i think it kind of was to jenny's detriment because it would have been really cool if they had a sequence where we see her get possessed by tom riddle and actually go and write instead of just seeing like little snippets of that yeah. but actually yeah. like an entire like five minute scene of her being possessed by him to go and do these these things like I i'm think sure in, I'm cool. just, you know i was thinking i'm sure like in 30 years time when they remake these films like <laughs> but they will 30 like, years that's they? generous <laughs> like i don't know I can't in seven this, years uh, yeah, yeah maybe maybe <laughs> seven or eight years they remake these films like yeah. they will definitely change up some of that stuff because a lot more modern times now you know they, they are recognizing hopefully that women actually 
do have an importance in movies and television like yeah. you know they've been so afraid for years to even do like a black widow movie and actually mm-hmm. it was a really good film um it's just unfortunate when they got released so i'm hoping that they do rejig some of this so um anyway let's move on to ratings so out of 10 um i would probably give it a six okay all right out of 10 um i'm i'm going six as well i gave the okay. first film a six i'm gonna give this one a six yeah i'm gonna give this a six so yeah um yeah i think there's there was probably some room for improvement here but. yeah room for improvement but it still did a good job of setting the tone but again if I, I i'm rating it compared to the rest of the series and again i know the series only goes up from here so Okay, so next episode, we'll be continuing our run towards our epic 100th episode. As we count down to that milestone, we'll be reviewing the rest of the Harry Potters. And next week, we'll be reviewing Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. That so, one's my favorite. Uh, you can follow us on social media. We're Geeks and Niche, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And you can get this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Google, Podbean, Apple, Spotify. We are everywhere. So please leave us a five-star review and tell your geeky friends. And have a good journey and have a good week. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye.